we can start um, to discuss the topic of team leadership and the topic of operational communication. Uh, what is the difference between the two? Uh, team leadership is the ability to conduct a team towards its mission and goals. Operational communication uh, in terms of leadership as the ability to develop messages that help the team to achieve its goals. So it's a mean for an end. Uh, we will see first some uh, basic principles that, um, that, that are uh, effective for studying uh, team leadership. The first principle is the so-called alignment with the objectives. And that is the source of energy for the group also. Uh, the first uh, thing that we want to share is that uh, we have to ask ourselves several questions. For example, on the team, do we want the same thing? Are we really sure that we want the same uh, objective? Very often there are hidden objectives that are mining the, the energy of the group. Then, can we feel what other people want? Are we able to feel? The, the feeling area has to do with emotional leadership. And emotional leadership is uh, one of the hottest topics nowadays for improving team uh, effectiveness. Then what different motivations are there among team members? Because there might be also motivations that uh, are connected to personal objectives, others that are connected to the organizational mission. So we have to see if there is a compatibility, if they are compatible or if they can become compatible. Then how to make sure that we want to achieve the same results. Uh, and then an, an issue that has to do with the linguistics, that is, do we have the same meaning for everyone about the words that are the keywords of the topic? For example, if I ask you to define what is an end state, what an end state is, very probably in 10 people, there will be 10 different uh, definitions, and that uh, can generate a problem of meanings, different meanings for the same words. So one thing that um, any team, uh, uh, any good team must do is to consolidate the meaning of the main words that they are working on. Uh, we have an example with the coronavirus crisis. Uh, is there a clear definition for the word or not? I, I still uh, see that there is not even a definition for the term pandemics. And there's not a definition for the word uh, cure. There's not a definition for the word uh, uh, end of crisis. What is the end of the crisis? You know? so, this is a linguistic problem, but it's very hard. Then when can we see that there are misunderstandings? And energy to the group, do you as a team member bring energy to the group you belong? Do you try, how do you do it? Um, as you see, these principles are uh, let's say general rules, golden rules that can be applied. They are. Uh, 21, so we will not go through all of them, but it's just to give you an idea that uh, when you have a good principle, then you are able to, um, to look at the team and look at the leadership uh, in a very different uh, uh, perspective. Let's see just uh, second, the second principle, communication of a good leader. First of all, the, the the fact that communication and quality of communication is a key factor for leadership, absolutely. So a good leader is also a good communicator. Uh, the communication of a good leader is clear and consistent. Um, in terms of STRATCOM, 
strategic communication, there must be a clear and consistent flow of messages with uh, also the so-called the Xs. The Xs is the who, when, how, why, and all the data that can help us to uh, move forward. Then uh, a good communication recognizes commitment, efforts, and results. So it's not, uh, uh, it's not uh, without emotions. A good communication has emotions. Then a good communication defines possible and motivating inputs. That means possible inputs. It's, if I tell you to move the moon, move the, move the moon for me, you will not do it. And not just because you are not a good team member, but it's impossible. So uh, there must be possible and motivating inputs for a good leadership. Then we have to deal with pride and recognition. That is, you have to become proud of the team you are in, and we have to recognize what you do for the team. Not just uh, tangible results, but very intangible issues, such as if you contribute to the team climate, on, on example. You have also to apply corrective interventions whenever a rule of the team is not uh, applied. And then you have to keep a good battle rhythm. A good battle rhythm is uh, the rhythm of messages and actions. So a good team leader does not communicate just once every uh, week or so, but several times a day there is a flow of communication and a good battle rhythm, which is also a, a term used in strategic uh, analysis. And now we can uh, step to, to a different, um, different area. And let me share, let me share another different presentation. Uh, we're going to talk about this, uh, some models of communication, the HPM model, the um, human potential modeling. HPM stands for human potential modeling. Uh, the key concept of the HPM model is that leadership requires energy. Uh, Without energy, there's no leadership. So we see um, a graphical depiction of what a leader is, and this is the leader, and the, these are the team members. Uh, together, they work uh, in order to produce tasks that are oriented towards a mission, a goal, or end states. So the ability to conduct a team and its single members towards understanding and implementation of mission-oriented goals and tasks. This is a definition of uh, team leadership. <clears throat> then we can see what operational communication is. It's the flow of communication acts between leader and team members and among team members necessary to move forward towards a task, goal, and mission. So if you see here, uh, data flows are in red, flows of data among the team members, and emotions, the uh, emotion side of a message. Uh, operational communication deals with both data messages and emotional messages. Uh, an example of a data communication is buy me three bottles of milk, okay, there are just, just data. Emotions, I feel this is a hard time. This, the, here you see there's not a, a specific uh, subject, but I feel, you know, it's, it's very important that a leader becomes able to enter the feelings area. Then uh, we see the HPM pyramid of human potential. 
And understanding this uh, model is really important for, for our purpose. Uh, the model is defined in uh, six cells, where cell one is the physical energies of a team member or the leader. Two is the mental energies area, so motivation, it's a called psychoenergetic state. Three is the micro skills, four macro skills. So the details, three is the details ability in managing details, and four is the ability in managing uh, the big picture of a situation. Then we have five, which is goals, uh, the uh, ability to define projects really. And six, we have the, the spiritual side. Uh, every objective has a spiritual side. There is a, a spiritual um, value in any team. If there's no spiritual value, the team is uh, really empty. So uh, we, can, we can also see here, I think you see the, the whiteboard. Let's imagine that here we have our pyramid, okay? And we have to focus really on which areas are full. Uh, we can imagine that uh, every area has a kind of indicator. So I can be from zero to 100, from zero to 100 uh, at a given level of energies in the body. This is part one. I can be same at a given level of energy in the motivational side, the so-called so psychoenergetic side, that is really the arousal, the, the kind of arousal that I have towards an idea or towards a project. And here we, we see immediately that we have uh, at least uh, four conditions, the bioenergetic and the psychoenergetic areas, okay? We can have uh, one, two, three, four. Four conditions of a team. The condition one is uh, where a team is uh, without energies. A team that is uh, really without psychological energy, even if the people are feeling well in terms of uh, bodily energies. The condition three is the deprivation of energies that can happen in a team under stress. Stress is a very important aspect of uh, team leadership, managing stress. Then we have the condition four, that is uh, the presence of a strong motivation, but the, the lack of bodily energies. And if you remember an example, Stephen Hawkins, that's a real example of the condition four, because his body was gone. He, he had no more control over his muscles and movements. But Stephen Hawkins still kept working hard at his science and still was able to produce uh, incredible results, even moving just an eye, okay? It's incredible, incredible man. The condition two instead is the so-called flow. I, I'm sure that uh, flow or peak condition, um, I'm sure that uh, you have heard some sometimes the, the word flow. The flow condition is the condition where the team works at, at its best. If it was a soccer team, an example, it would be like uh, the, the competing team is, is slow. They, they really cannot uh, play anymore. The, the flow condition is the top performance condition of a team. The same can happen here. 
in uh, micro skills. Here we have uh, another matrix. Here we have the micro skills. Here we have the macro skills, okay? The ma um, just to remind, ma micro skills are the skills uh, that relate to ability in details. Be very good in details. Macro skills are instead the ability to grasp the big picture, the helicopter view of the situation. The, they are very different set of skills. So plus and minus, plus and minus. Here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, okay? And here we have still a different view of leadership. A leader that is in situation seven is not able to, to be good in details and doesn't have a good uh, understanding of the big picture. Instead, uh, here five. Five is the type of leader that uh, is very good in details, but lacks of the big picture. So you are good in managing, uh, for example, you are very good on the computer. You are very skilled in computer science or in managing programs, but really you don't have any idea of where your team is going, where your mission is going, where your organization is going. You are kind of, um, in a fog about that, okay? Eight instead is a, eight is an interesting type of leader because eight is a leader that doesn't know much about details. So how people do things, that's not his question. It's not his question mark. How do people do things? He's not interested in that. Uh, th that type of leader here is interested in uh, the vision. So in the big picture, in the overall analysis of the situation. And of course, here we have again the flow condition. The flow condition, that means uh, when you are able to uh, manage details and also to manage the big picture, you are in a very powerful condition. It's called flow. Then in the last uh, segment, we have, uh, again, we have projects and we have a uh, spiritual side. And again, four areas. Okay, uh, even if it's a small, uh, I will explain it to you. The, the situation there is that uh, the flow, the real flow of leadership arises when there is a good, uh, when there is a good uh, ability to manage projects. So to get things done, really to get things done. And uh, there is also a, a strong spiritual background. The spiritual background is uh, one of the most overlooked areas of leadership. Uh, we tend to, to assume that uh, the spirituality has to do only with uh, uh, religious groups, uh, but it's not true. There is a spirituality in every team and in every group. The degree to which you, you feel that you are working towards something important and that has values is a spirituality. So the type 11 of leadership is a leader that has no project management ability and no spirituality. So we, we call it empty leadership. Empty leaders are not able to get things done 
and they don't even know why they wake up in the morning. <laughs> That's terrible. The nine. The nine is the so-called operational leader. The operational leader is a guy or a girl that can get things done, but someone has to tell him or her what needs to be done. So it's um, an ability of uh, generating uh, projects, but not of ideation of uh, projects. So they must receive uh, goals, missions, and then they can get things done. The type 11, 12, sorry, the type 12 of leadership is instead uh, this very spiritual leader that doesn't care very much about how people uh, do things, but it's full of uh, signs of spiritual and wisdom and uh, can generate the so-called charismatic leadership. The charisma is really the generation of a strong uh, moral forces. And then again, we have the flow. So if you see here, leadership is really a hard task because it requires us to, to be able to, to get the flow in our energies, body and mind. To get the flow in our skills, micro and macro skills. And to find the flow in the objectives area, that is uh, the flow of projects and the flow of, of spirituality. So it's really a hard job to be, to be a leader. It's, it's really a hard job because it, you have to step from the real bodily side up to the very spiritual side. And uh, it's not easy. In fact, great leaders are really not so much. And, Leadership has not to do with the position in an organization, but with the ability to inspire people. So it's kind of a hard job, as we say. Um, so we can discuss about this uh, EXA leadership model. The EXA leadership model is also in the book that uh, you received, I think you received it by mail or you will receive it soon. It's a, it's a more than, it's about 200 pages uh, about uh, leadership. So, okay, it's, it's a really uh, powerful book about leadership in English. And what it discusses is uh, primal leadership, the type of leadership that uh, that is the leader, uh, leadership of the strongest, okay? The alpha leader. Psychonic leadership, courage, determination, lack of fear. Micro leadership, highly specialized tasks. Then macro leadership, managing the overall picture. Then high in the pyramid project leadership display the ability managing execution then we have spiritual leadership values wisdom spirituality so we can really have a profile of leaders the prime leaders have this kind of profile that you see here that's the alpha male behavior, basically rude, aggressive, displays territorial defense, bodily strength, power display, okay? I'm sure you recognize some people that you know that have this uh, bodily type of uh, leadership. Psychoenergetic leaders instead are leaders because of determination, lack of fear, motivation, resistance, and resilience, mental awareness, mental strength, positivism, and optimism, okay? 
So this is a, not absolutely a bodily type of uh, leader, but instead a, a psychological leader. Then we have micro leaders. They are able to pay attention to details, very small details, localized skills. They look for perfection, perfection of movements and thoughts. Uh, they are really obsessed with perfection. They seek improvements on segments of performance. They are focused on individual skills and they uh, have a hyper specialization. So it's a kind of, let's say, engineer hyper specialized on a specific uh, area of engineering with not much understanding of uh, the rest of the world and not to talk about uh, topics except engineering. Then we have the micro leaders that they means to have a helicopter view of the organization and the team. Wide spectrum of skills. Uh, in America, they are called the polymath. Polymath means that you are skilled in uh, humanistic sciences, but also in uh, um, more scientific, let's call them uh, statistics or whatever it is. Understanding of interconnections of the system, look for balance and equilibrium interaction among parts and the overall system performance. Project leaders instead are obsessed, or really obsessed with getting things done, okay? Sometimes it doesn't even matter what, but it's important to get it done, okay? So they are focused on deadlines, steps, to-do lists everywhere, to-do lists everywhere, individual task distribution and segments of flow, individual responsibilities, execution. That's the job of project uh, leaders. Then we have spiritual leaders. The problem of spiritual leaders is why we do things, why do we do what we do, okay? Uh, the problem of spiritual leaders is also what happens to future generations. There is a great law of seven, the seventh generation sustainability. It's a native Indian American law of the Iroquois that says that uh, we have a leader is great when he or she thinks at the effects up to the seventh generation ahead. What will happen to them? and our choices become a part of that. So spreading values, not just projects, soul, spirit, enlightenment, and global responsibilities. So if you, if you see, I work a lot with uh, business leaders and you can really tell if there is a, a sense of the global responsibility that you have acting locally. So we have the so-called global leaders. Global leaders are those who think global and act locally. It's very important to, to be that kind of leader. Uh, any profile of any leader then can be a combination of all the six factors. You, you see here an example, a, a fully empowered leader fully empowered leader. Why? Because very strong spiritual uh, energies, a good body, good motivation, good ability to grasp details, good ability in the macro view of the organization, and also able to develop projects. So this is a really fully empowered leader. Which, which is not common, it's, we have to think it's not common. It's not common to have a spiritual leader who is also a great project leader and also has attention to his or her body, not being a bodybuilder, but 
pays attention to the body and to psychology. So it, it really requires a stretching of our view of leadership. And here we have some principles, but I already um, talked, I already uh, displayed two principles. I want to step to principle six, the so-called communication quality principles. And what is the, what is the, the point here? In relationship with colleagues, internal clients, superiors, and collaborators, before transmitting any information or project, they must be checked to ensure that they are understandable, complete, functional, and they create as few complications as possible to the colleague of internal user of the work. That, that there must be a question in, in every team is that is, am I generating problems with my message, with my actions, with my way of working? Am I generating problems to others? Or am I helping others do better their jobs, okay? So it's called the principle of minimizing the problems of others. It's, it's a, we can underline it or make it bold, you know, principle of minimizing the problem of others. Because you see, if, if it's a team of 10 people and you have 10 people that work with this principle, that team will be a great team. It will be beautiful to work in that team. Otherwise, it will be a nightmare, okay? Then here we, uh, we see um, the different areas of communication for team leadership, the so-called communication skill set, okay? Uh, a good team leader must be strong in organizational communication, okay? Empowerment communication, psychology of persuasion, assertive communication, and empathic communication. What are they? Organizational communication is the ability to be able to define projects, steps, and roles. So it's a very practical issue. Empowerment communication instead is to be able to provide people with the right level of delegation and authority, okay? This guy here, organizational, has the problem of a project. Here, the, the, the problem is to empower people, to let them feel that they have power, they're not powerless. Psychology of persuasion, to be able to convince and persuade people, and then assertive communication, to be able to define rules and expectations. Uh, emphatic communication, to be able to listen well and strong listening skills, understand people and tune in with people, okay? So we can call them one, organizational, two, empowerment, three, persuasion, four, The definition of assertive communication so that is to define rules and expectations. And five, empathy, listening skills, feeling skills, emotional skills. So if you like to write, where do you think that teams and organizations in the military area where you work in which of the five areas do they need to work more? I'm sure that you know your team. You know your team, the team that works for you or the team that you are in. <clears throat> Any working group can work in, a, in one of these uh, five uh, areas. That is uh, apathy, you are annoyed, boredom, the routine, the average day, or instead move to dynamism, 
search for quality or move to excellence and passion or even become obsessed with perfection and becoming a maniac, okay? Uh, let me tell you that uh, this one here is not good, boredom, apathy, okay? Boredom is not good. The routine is uh, sometimes necessary, but here on the green and on the blue one, we really have to work. That is to search for dynamism, search for quality in what we do, and search for excellence and passion. Instead, what we not, we don't have to, to look for is obsession. So any team leader is a good team leader if he finds the, the intangible threshold between excellence and obsession. It's intangible, but it's really important. Uh, there's also a conversational uh, side of, uh, of leadership. The conversational side is uh, the ability of a leader in uh, leading conversations. One example, one can display agreement on a topic, disagreement, a strategic move, move is so-called the upking. Upking means to increase the emphasis of something. For uh, example, you tell me something and I tell you, oh, this is very important. Tell, tell me something more, okay? Downking means to decrease the emphasis, okay? You, you report me a problem and I can tell you, okay, no, don't worry too much. <clears throat> and we let it flow. Topic shifting, changing the topic of the conversation. Topic setting, define the topic of the conversation. This is, and code switching, example, switching from assertive to empathic. Uh, we can step to, the, um, to an example of um, wrong message and improved messages. For example, imagine if you are in a group and you receive this message. Remind me that one of these days we have to meet to analyze that problem. What, what is the effect of this uh, statement? The sender and the receiver can forget the problem overwhelmed and covered by other incoming problems. And then there is an unusual and a useless cognitive effort, remember to remember, okay? Let's see an improved message. This is the improved version. The problem of server number 10 breakdown is important. We have to we take action to analyze it. Let's now look at the agenda to find a common date and an hour to meet in an exact day and time of the next week. Uh, this message is much more operational, okay? And that's good. Another typical conversation, oh, that guy, the one from Rome, he called and he said to call him back. Problem. Uh, I know at least 12 clients in Rome. Which one is the one that uh, called? So there is a so-called cognitive effort. The cognitive effort is the effort that you do when trying to understand a message. What is an improved version here? This one. Davide Rossi, the CEO of Datasoft in Rome, called. The CEO would like a meeting within the next month on the discount theme. Shall I answer or would you rather do it? Much more clear, much lower cognitive effort, much more operational. Uh, this one is very common. I, I did put the... Um, the file for you on the server. 
problem. There are 100 folders, at least, on the server. In which one did you put the file? And what is the file name? Let's see an improved version. I did put in folder number five on the server, the file on the USA situation analysis. The file name is the USA underscore analysis 01 for doc doc. I've already linked the file for you, and this would mean that you click here and you open the file. Just click it, it will open the file, the file immediately. Uh, if you see that you would really like to receive this message, not the first one. So a very um, brief explanation of the intercultural aspect of uh, communication by means of the four distances model uh, you can imagine a person person a and person b person a has a self that is biological and is also a role and identity and person B has his self, his biology, his role, his identity. D1 is really the code distance between person A and person B. Uh, it means that if you have a strong D1, you do not accept the other person. Uh, to, to be a teacher, you have to have students. If someone doesn't accept the role of student, you cannot have teachers. That there is a strong uh, connection between roles. This instead is, uh, is the code distance. If I speak in uh, my city dialect, uh, and another speaks only Italian, there will be a strong code distance. And this one is, is, if you listen to a Japanese and you don't know Japanese, you will experience a strong D2. D3 instead is the ideological and value distance. When you feel that the other person has values that are opposed to yours, or instead that the, his or her values are um, nice and, and you like them because they are similar to yours. D4 instead is the referential distance. That is, what portion of the world have you seen? external world and internal world okay so you, have, you really have to imagine that these persons can be close relational distance very close or can be very far high relational distance and when you have high relational distance uh, to a given point there's a breakdown the relationship has a breakdown so this model explains well uh, that how and why communication breakdowns do happen. Okay, so we see that there is a so-called D1, the, the, the role distances, the, the different ways of interpreting a role, and if they are not compatible, there is a role, a breakdown in communication. Then we can have a breakdown in communication due, due to uh, inability to share a, a communication code. Uh, if you want, I can give you an example. I can talk in the dialect of my town, which is uh, Ferrara in the north and east side of Italy. And let let me know if you understand what I'm going to say. Ho oh, in cuore che proprio anche preso un gran bel tempo perché anche piove e brutto. 
Actually, you didn't understand what I just said. That's an example of D2, when we don't share a, a, a common code, okay? Then we have a D3. The D3 is really when we don't share values. When we, we don't share values, uh, or even worse, our values are absolutely uh, not, not compatible. Uh, if I'm pro-nuclear energy, you are very much against you, nuclear energy, and we start to discuss discussing about energy, we can have a strong problem, okay? And we see it also nowadays when we face with uh, the coronavirus crisis, the value of the uh, economy against the value of uh, public uh, safety, it seems uh, a contradiction. It is really not a contradiction because uh, there can be ways of uh, opening uh, companies, uh, uh, even providing uh, sanitary health conditions, okay? The, but if I'm pro-opening, you are against opening, we experience a D3 distance. I would like to show you an example of, but maybe later I can show you some other videos. And here instead we have the D4. The D4 is really when we do not have the history that can allow us to understand each other. We have not experienced the same world. We, we don't understand the other person in terms of empathy because we, we, we have not lived his or her experiences. And to conclude, I would say that uh, all the four types of incommunicability of uh, communication breakdown can happen, but not only can happen, they will happen. They will happen if we don't pay attention to good communication practices. That is to say that there is a tendency towards uh, incommunicability in every group, uh, and we have to, to generate work, training, coaching for the group to improve its communication skills. Absolutely. There, there's no group that will become a high potential group if he, the group doesn't work on communication skills with training, coaching, and specialized intervention. 